All right, last week we uh, were discussing John the Immerser. Uh, we talked about uh, the Nazarite vow. Uh, has nothing to do with Nazareth. It's Nazirite. Uh, and we talked about the fact that sometimes the Nazarite vow is attributed to John the Baptist. Certainly, there are certain aspects of it that are mentioned by Gabriel regarding what he wouldn't wouldn't do. But there are several other aspects that aren't. Nothing is said about those specific things. Uh, for instance, regarding the not drinking of any wine or strong drink. Certainly, that is mentioned in Luke chapter 1, uh, that he would not be drinking those things. However, that in of itself is not all that comprises of the Nazarite vow. Also, the not cutting of hair, uh, the not associating with anything unclean or dead bodies, things like that. Uh, that's all in Numbers chapter 6. And so, while it's possible that John had taken the vow, it is never mentioned. Also, it's often referred to Jesus as having taken the Nazarite vow. How do we know, at least as of the point when he started teaching and preaching, we know that that wasn't the case? What did, often, what did Jesus often drink of? Fruit of the vine. Okay, and that's actually specifically, it's not just strong drink and, and uh, wine that is forbidden for John, uh, but under the Nazarite vow, also anything of a vine. That would include tomato juice, grape juice, I mean, anything that grows on a vine, the Nazarites were not to drink of it. So uh, certainly Jesus uh, did drink of fruit of the vine, uh, what the, the New Testament refers to as wine, understanding that from that period of time what that means. That's not the wine we have today. Uh, but also, as we noted with John, John, uh, the, the angel said that John would not drink of wine or strong drink. Didn't say anything about anything regarding the, the, the fruit of the vine specifically, necessarily. Uh, so whether or not that was included in that, uh, that topic from Gabriel to Zacharias is unknown. So regarding the Nazarite vow, even though a lot of people... Uh, uh, kind of attribute that vow to John and Jesus. Neither one of them in the New Testament are ever said. In fact, the term Nazarite or the vow of the Nazarites is not mentioned once in the New Testament. Uh, there is mention of vows, and there was a vow that Paul undertook, uh, although that does not seem to have been the Nazarite vow either, uh, but uh, not a Nazarite vow. In Malachi chapter 4 and in verse 5, we have a prophecy from God to the children of Israel regarding this judgment he was going to bring, he was going to change things. He calls it the great and dreadful day of the Lord in verse 5. He says, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord, and he will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the earth with a curse. Now, this is quoted in Luke chapter 1 by Gabriel regarding John. Now, when we talk about the coming of Elijah, this is something that was attributed to uh, messianic, having a messianic connection all through uh, the, from the uh, captivity on through into uh, uh, the New Testament times before Jesus came, when people were looking for the Messiah, they attributed it to either G the, the Messiah having the spirit of Elijah or a prophet coming and assisting the, the, the Messiah when he came. So they recognized that Malachi chapter 4 has messianic connections. Now, obviously, a lot of people didn't necessarily expect Elijah personally to come back, although some did. Uh, in fact, we'll see here in just a little while how that there are some who, who thought maybe Jesus was even Elijah. Uh, but the fact of the matter was, it is interesting that did Elijah come back? Yeah, Mount of Transfiguration. There were two people on the Mount of Transfiguration. Who, well, two additional with Jesus and Peter and John and James. Moses and Elijah. Okay, it is interesting, although that's not specifically what God is referring to here in Malachi chapter 4, the fact that you had Elijah and Moses, the Moses, the giver of the law, Elijah representing all the prophets, and of course, Jesus would often say that the law and the prophets all spoke about whom? Jesus. 
him. Yeah, uh, the law and the prophets, all of them spoke uh, regarding his coming and what he was going to accomplish. But here in Malachi chapter 4 and in verse 5, God says, I'll send you Elijah the prophet. The idea being the, the one who had the same power, the same spirit, uh, that same zeal, that same character, not reincarnated uh, and not a, literally a spirit in the sense of he wasn't human, but someone who would kind of work in the same way as Elijah did to, for God, this one would come before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. Now, it's interesting because a lot of times we think of the great and dreadful day of the Lord as being like maybe judgment day. Uh, but here in verse 5, what's it in connection to? I mean, it is connected to judgment in a sense, but it's connected to the coming of the Messiah. Uh, and as it pertains to the coming of the Messiah, that day when God's going to change everything. Okay, everything that the children of Israel knew and understood, not that, not that their knowledge of Jehovah was going to change, but regarding the law, that was all going to be put to an end. And there was going to be a new, there was going to be a shift, and there was going to be a new covenant that would be established. And that's how God's using this great and dreadful day of the Lord, not necessarily specifically about judgment day, but about this change that would be accomplished um, through the messenger or uh, through, through uh, the Messiah that the messenger is going to prepare the way for. Then in verse 6, he says he will turn. This is specifically about this messenger, the spirit of Elijah. Uh, he will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children, the hearts of the ch children to the fathers. Now, what do you think that means? He'll turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to the fathers. What do you... Okay. 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 Anything else? So when we read, the, and there's a lot of different ways in which this passage, you read a lot of the commentaries, there's like all kinds of, there's physical aspect, there's a uh, emotional aspect, a mental aspect, there's certainly a spiritual aspect to it. But what's interesting is when we actually allow this to be connected to what Gabriel himself says back in Luke chapter 1. So in Luke chapter 1 and in verse 17, so starting in verse 16, this is what the angel's telling Zacharias that John was going to accomplish. So let, let Gabriel actually kind of give us the commentary for how he's using Malachi. He says, he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God implying that many of the children of Israel aren't actually serving the Lord, even though maybe they think and convince themselves that they were. It says in verse 17, he will go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah. And then he quotes directly from Malachi chapter 4, to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children. Now that's all he quotes of Malachi 4, but he expands on this to kind of help us understand what he's talking about. And the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Now, when you put verse 16 and 17 together, and there are, there's going to be physical aspects to it, uh, I believe, that is going to be accomplished by John. There's going to be um, mental or emotional aspects to it as well, I believe. But when you look at the spiritual aspect on its own, the concept that you have individuals who the fathers, especially the fathers of the Jews, okay, when we talk about the fathers of the Jews, we're talking about Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, who all walked in faith, okay, the Hebrew writer in Hebrews chapter 11 mentions these individuals, he talks about Moses, he talks about David, these giants, I guess you could say, of the history of Israel, individuals whose faith was held up as a standard, even if they weren't always perfect, their faith was a kind of a standard for Israel. And yet Israel was no longer walking in the ways that they were supposed to go. They were no longer serving and obeying God, the just living by faith. Instead, now they were seeking to receive just or receive righteousness through the law. And they were convinced 
that they could have forgiveness of sins by offering their sacrifices and by paying their tithes and look at how holy and righteous I am, God. Well, in verse 16 and 17, what, what uh, the angel says about what, what John was going to accomplish is he's going to kind of revive that spiritual awareness that had become dulled. They were no longer aware of their state and that while they were serving the law, okay, and, and again, sometimes their heart wasn't in it, but the fact of the matter was they had become dulled or desensitized to the concept of sin. And for that matter, the, oh, the, the demand for justice for sin, how angry sin makes God, they had to be reminded of the... Uh, of the nature of the relationship that is meant to exist between God and his people because they had lost that. They'd forgotten that. Right. Kind of going through the motions, so to speak. Yeah. Right. And, and and, you know, a lot of us have talked about the, the, the changing of the covenant that God, you know, he said he would write the, the law on their hearts. But, but that didn't mean that under the Old Testament, or for that matter, the patriarchal law, that the, that law wasn't to be written on the hearts of those who sought to follow God. But instead, because it was written on tablets of stone under the Mosaical law, that's where all the attention went. And so over time, again, the just shall live by faith, not by the law. And Paul makes a big deal about this in the book of Romans. But they are still commanded to obey God. It's not that obedience to the law isn't necessary, but it's that the right perspective and the right focus has to be there. You serve God by faith and, and uh, full conviction, full trusting, and then you obey him to do what he tells you to do. Well, they had, they had forgotten that. They had become desensitized in a lot of ways to what that was supposed to be. And so what John is going to accomplish is he's going to kind of, we talk about raising the spiritual awareness of others. We, we have no power to save an individual. That's not on us. We have no power to force an individual to listen or to believe or anything else. What we do have the ability to do is raise the spiritual awareness of others, to, to maybe inspire them to think about their soul, to ask questions, to maybe look into the scriptures. Well, what John was sent to do was to raise the awareness of Israel that they really are still lost in the sense that their sins have not been washed away. They're thinking they're fully, um, com completely clean of any sin. But as the Hebrew writer points out in Hebrews chapter 9 and 10, the day of atonement doesn't suggest in any way remission, but rather remembrance every year, the sins of the people. And so there was no remission, but Israel thought there was. Israel thought they had, didn't have a problem. And this is what John's purpose was going to be. He was going to prepare the way of the Lord and help them to understand that they needed to uh, oh, be aware of the fact that they did have sin. And in a lot of ways, we talk about his, and we'll talk more about it here in just a minute, the baptism unto repentance for the remission of sins. Okay, what he baptized for was not remission of sins. There was no blood of Jesus that had been shed by which would, or and for that matter, Jesus hadn't been raised from the dead yet, which is what gives baptism its power, according to 1 Peter chapter 3.21. But what he did do, and baptism immersion wasn't a new concept. Okay, this is something the Jews, there was a kind of a traditional element to immersion that the Jews were aware of. But what John preached was being immersed and thus buried and committed to recognizing that I have sin that I must repent from because the law, I can't just sin and then offer my sacrifices and I can, then I go sin, then I can offer my sacrifice. They were convinced they could do that. They didn't think about the need to repent, to change their ways, to consider their, their character. And so this is part of what John was sent to accomplish in Matthew chapter 11 Matthew chapter 11 and in verse 14. So this is as Jesus is, he's talking about, so this is after uh, John's, some of John's disciples had come 
to ask Jesus some questions, and we'll talk about that more in here in just a minute. After they leave to go tell John what they saw, Jesus turns to the rest of the multitudes. He says, what did you go out in the wilderness to see? A reed shaken by the wind? What did you go out to see? A man clothed in soft garments? Indeed, those who wear soft clothing are in king's houses. What did you go out to see? So did you go out to be entertained? Did you go out to see something for no reason? I mean, what did you go out to see? A prophet? Yeah. Yeah, he was a prophet. But more than a prophet... And in fact, in verse 10, Jesus says, This is he of whom, is written before, uh, of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way before you. Uh, we'll jump down to verse uh, 13. For all the prophets and the law, that's Moses and Elijah, prophesied until John. So you have this representation of all of the prophets and all of the law, everything that was of the Jews, prophesying to that moment. Before the Messiah comes, there's going to be a messenger to prepare his way. And that was John. Verse 14, if you are willing to receive it, he is Elijah who is to come. And by is to come, he's not saying in the future. He's saying he was the one who was to come that was prophesied he is to come. But he came already. So that's what verse 14, Jesus specifically says. And Jesus doesn't even use the phrase, the spirit of Elijah. He says he is Elijah. He's the one that is referred to specifically in Malachi chapter 4 that was to to come and accomplish what the Lord had had established to do. All right, any thoughts through that? Okay, so going back to Luke chapter 1, notice in verse 15. Remember, we mentioned this before, how that he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even from his mother's womb. And then later here in Luke chapter 1, we see this event with Mary. When he hears Mary's voice, he leaps. He's six months along in the womb. He leaps when he hears Mary's voice. Uh, So there's some kind of awareness there as to who she is. And I, I certainly think the Holy Spirit is involved in that. But what's interesting is when we turn to John chapter 10, John chapter 10, notice starting in verse 40. I'll we'll start in verse 39. So this is talking about Jesus. Jesus is right on the heels of saying, listen, if you don't believe me, that's fine. You don't have to believe the things I say. Look at the works that I do. If the works that I do are of God, then you should believe I'm of God. If the works I do are not of God, they would have to be of Satan, of the devil. Okay, so you got to, which one is it? If the works I do match the things that prophets of old did, and in fact, everybody acknowledged, nobody, Nicodemus in John chapter 3 recognized, nobody could do these things unless he were from God. Uh, Verse 39, therefore they sought again to seize him, but he escaped out of their hand. And so in verse 40, he went away again beyond the Jordan to the place where John was baptizing at first, and there he stayed. Then many came to him and said, John performed no sign, but all the things that John spoke about this man were true, and many believed in him there. There's some debate as to what verse 41 means specifically regarding miraculous works. Now, you talk about the spirit of Elijah, okay? What all did Elijah do in, through the power of God? What, what signs did Elijah do? Fire. Yeah, he brought down fire on several regiments of soldiers who came uh, to bring him to the king until that third regiment came. And finally, that, that commander, he, he, knew, he, knew, he knew he had to really be very, very gentle, very humble in the presence of Elijah. I mean, you had numerous examples of Elijah and the miracles he did. Uh, the uh, the even after he died, what? Or I'm not sorry. Not, I'm thinking of Elisha, uh, but Elijah regarding the the, the uh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay. So you got the, you got Baal um, uh, and the calling down of the fire to that that consumed the sacrifice. Uh, I'm thinking of the widow that Elijah stayed with for a while. 
Uh, and that was also uh, a situation that showed great power as well. But notice verse 41, it says, John performed no sign. Now, some have taken this to mean that this, what they're saying is that John didn't perform any signs as it, as it pertained to the Messiah. Now, I don't see how that's relevant. They said John performed no sign, but all the things that John spoke about this man. Okay, now I tend to think that verse 41 is very broad. That John may not have performed miracles, but what John said. And of course, much of John's teaching was about the coming of the Messiah and what Jesus was going to do, what he was going to teach. That even though John didn't show forth miraculous power, people still considered him a prophet. And I think that's really interesting because that, that's how I take verse 41. Again, some people take, well, he, just, he performed miracles. It just wasn't any miracles as it pertained to Jesus. And to me, there's, there's, they're, they're intertwined. What John taught regarding the, the kingdom of God being at hand had everything to do with the Messiah. That's what his purpose was. He wasn't on an island on his own. His, his purpose was all about preparing for the Messiah. So everything he did, everything he taught, at some point came back to Jesus. And this is what people saw. Everything that John said, they said these things were true. Because this man, who John says is the Messiah, everything he said before Jesus came along and started his ministry, John was preaching and teaching and saying, this is what he's going to do. And everybody seeing it take place in Jesus. But John performed no sign, no miracle. Now, to me, that, 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 if, if it's the case that John, despite having the spirit of Elijah, despite being filled with the Holy Spirit from his mother's womb, it shows that there were miraculous gifts. I say miraculous gifts. There were uh, spiritual gifts beyond the observable. You know, we talk about a miracle being the suspension of natural law, the observable suspension of natural law. Okay, that's something like Jesus walking on the water. That's, that's observably unnatural, supernatural. However, there were other gifts that weren't necessarily observable suspension of natural law. They were still gifts of God. And we would still call them miraculous but it's not necessarily observable. Think about how the apostles or how the writers of the New Testament were inspired to write what they wrote. How the Holy Spirit guided them, and he guided the apostles to remember all the things that Jesus had said and done. But how that process took place, regardless of how it took place within the mind, it wasn't something that other people could see and say, wow, that was a miracle. And yet the Holy Spirit was involved in it. And so it makes you wonder about being filled with the Holy Spirit and the times where being filled with the Holy Spirit, certainly there were times where it did have to do with presumably miraculous things. You think about Samson, despite his character, he was quote unquote filled with the Spirit and he went about killing Philistines with his great strength. Well, in this case with John, I suggest that maybe the the fullness of the spirit being described here is about his knowledge, the things that he taught, his you know, wisdom, his connecting of Old Testament prophecy to what the Messiah is going to accomplish, that it didn't, it didn't have to revolve around, um, or that it wasn't yet time, let's put it, put it that way, it wasn't yet time to introduce those miraculous gifts and works as it pertained to the coming of the Messiah. Okay, Jesus was going to, to do those things. Later on, the apostles through the name of Jesus would do those things. But I suggest that John didn't do those works. And yet, people still saw him as a prophet. And I think that speaks volumes to John's work ethic. I think it speaks volumes to his, again, however augmented or benefited by the, the, the spirit or not, his knowledge and his wisdom of being able to talk to others and to be bold, we'll talk about it in a minute, to, to speak the truth. Thoughts or comments through that? Uh, to me, this is just a, it's just a, 
a huge statement that sometimes gets overlooked, that John performed no sign, and yet everything he said about what Jesus would do and say, he was right. And, and to me, that's just a, an amazing statement. And, and that John had so many people who came to be baptized of him unto repentance. And he did his job. He accomplished his mission to prepare a, a core group of people within Israel. Not everybody did. And there were even some who came out to him mainly because everybody else was. They had no intention of actually repenting of their sins or, or examining their, their character. But yet, many people did. All right. So, going to Luke chapter 3. So, this is when John begins his ministry, I guess you could say. We talk about Jesus' ministry. Well, this is where John begins his so starting in Luke chapter 3 and in verse 1, in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Pon Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate being governor of Judea, Herod being tetrarch of Galilee, his brother Philip tetrarch of Eturia, and the region of uh, Trachonitis and Licinius tetrarch of Abilene. Uh, I think it's interesting, verse 1, the reason we read that is, remember how Luke, when he writes to Theophilus, how he says, I went about to set in order the things that took place so that you can know, you can have certainty of the things that you were taught. Luke didn't skimp on the, on the, uh, the details, did he? Okay, he was very exact in his recording of these things. And this is part of the reason how we can date some of this stuff as well when you couple what we have here with other external sources regarding Tiberius Caesar and so forth. Starting in verse 2, while Annas and Caiaphas were high priests... How was that possible? You had two high priests. Yep, you had one who was properly of the law, and then you had the one that was appointed by the Romans. Okay, after the Romans took over, they wanted to kind of have their own liaison that they could count on and trust with the Sanhedrin, and so they appointed their own high priest. So you, that's how you had these two high priests. In fact, when Jesus eventually was examined and tried, uh, the night that he was betrayed, he was there's like five different trials in that span of eight hours before he was put on the cross because he was before Pilate, then he was sent to Herod, then he was sent back to Pilate, then he was sent, or before he even got to the, got to Pilate, he was sent to, he was before the Sanhedrin, then he was sent to uh, Annas, um, the, the one, the, the, I believe Annas was the one of the, who was appointed actually by the law, and then Annas sent him back to Caiaphas, and I mean, he was all over. Uh, so we see in verse 2, it was at this point that the word of God came to John, the son of Zacharias in the wilderness. And he went into all the region around the Jordan, preaching a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. As it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah, the prophet saying, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Every valley shall be filled and every mountain and hill brought low. The crooked places shall be made straight, and the rough ways smooth, and all flesh shall see the salvation of God. Now, Isaiah is another messianic uh, component that, to, that Isaiah offers, but this is about John, specifically. Uh, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Now, you combine that with what Malachi says about the, the, the great and dreaded day of the Lord, and you see kind of what the point of this is. That this is an event when the Messiah, not only the Messiah was born, because that's not what this is referring to, is it? It's not just Jesus being born, but what? The teaching that Jesus offered, ultimately leading him to the cross, that is what's being referred to. Uh, and certainly everything that would go into it as well, fulfilling the prophet of Joel in Acts chapter 2 and everything else as well. But specifically, preparing for the Lord's teaching. Uh, and again, we know that John is six months older than Jesus, but when you talk about the 15th year, that aligns somewhere around 29 A.D., or so, kind of gives us the ballpark of when John started his teaching and preaching in the wilderness. Then that takes place for about a year and a half or so when Jesus starts. Now, there was a period of overlap between John and Jesus. We don't know how long John continued while Jesus continued his ministry exactly, uh, 
but the general estimates put it around six months. So altogether, John probably was teaching and preaching for about two years before he eventually was killed. Uh, six months of a bit of an overlap, give or take, uh, with Jesus as well. Thoughts or comments through that? Luke 11 and in verse 1, another oft overlooked passage sometimes because we focus on what Jesus teaches in the Lord's Prayer, which obviously we should, but just kind of a statement in passing that we find about what John also was doing. What all was he teaching? What all was he telling these, these multitudes to do? Well, in verse 1, it came to pass as Jesus was praying in a certain place when he ceased one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray as John also taught his disciples. Now, was John's prayer similar to how Jesus, what his prayer, uh, the, the pattern that Jesus gives? I imagine it probably was similar. Uh, I imagine, I mean, given the, the, the principles that Jesus is providing within his example, what we call the Lord's Prayer, I imagine they're because, I mean, all prayers should have similar topics or similar principles contained within them. The acknowledgement of Jehovah, his power, his authority, our trust in him, uh, thanking him for his blessings. So I imagine the similar topics were covered by John as well. But I just think that's an interesting, random little uh, piece of information that John taught his disciples how to pray as well. And apparently one of these disciples, whoever this was that said this, was aware of it. I just think that's kind of neat. Thoughts or comments through that? All right, going back to Luke chapter 3. And in verse 3, he went into all the region around the Jordan preaching a baptism of repentance unto, or for, or unto, the remission of sins. Now, when we talk about the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins, what this is doing is people are going out there, they're hearing what John has to say. And there's going to be details later on here in just a little bit, like verse 7 and 8, about some of the things that he was telling these people. But the concept of the need to repent is actually at the cornerstone of, well, even today, when we refer to Christianity as a whole, okay, all churches or faiths that are Christ-centric, every one of them, at least aside from some of the other, like, like uh, Calvinism and, and things like that, that kind of have some weird ideas, the majority of Christian churches teach the necessity for repentance, okay? Except for, you know, like I said, the, the uh, predetermination and that sort of thing. It doesn't matter. You're either saved or you're saved or you're not, you're not. Uh, but all, most all faiths teach regarding salvation that repentance is required. It's interesting that if, if baptism isn't necessary for forgiveness of sins, what exactly the purpose of repentance is when you start looking at what the scriptures teach. But regardless, very few people will argue with you if you suggest that the very first component of salvation is, I have to acknowledge I need a savior. And that's exactly the reason why John was sent to the people to start with, was that they didn't really think they needed a savior because they had the law, they had the sacrifices. But that wasn't enough that didn't save them. Blood of bulls and goats couldn't take away their sin. They didn't realize that or understand that. And certainly there was that component of misunderstanding of just to live by faith, not by the law. And so as a result, John is sent to teach people the most fundamental, most basic thought process is that the law doesn't save you. Okay, you have to repent of your sin. You have to turn your heart and your mind back to serving God in full faith and assurance and conviction and seek to do what's right, not just rely on the sacrifices to make you saved. And that's what he's teaching the people in verse 3. So that when Jesus does come and he teaches about what character God expects, he teaches about how to enter into the kingdom of heaven, he teaches about baptism for the remission of sins, then the people are already in a mindset to realize, okay, we need a savior. The law by itself can't save us. That's what this Messiah is all about. So when Jesus comes, they're receptive to hear what's the next step. And that's what John was sent to do. And that's what he did. Nolan? 
Did I see your hand? No? Okay. Any thoughts or comments through that? Yeah. Yeah. Well, and that's why he says the kingdom of heaven is at hand, because it would only be a year, year and a half before Jesus started teaching and preaching. You know, and then the kingdom of heavens, it's, I mean, the, 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 the information you need is here. Uh, in verse, in Mark chapter 1, uh, starting in verse 2, notice verse 1 actually. Notice how Mark starts this. He says, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And now what does he immediately quote? He quotes, he quotes about John. And it goes to show the connection of John not being of Judaism, specifically, but rather of the fulfillment of Judaism and introducing the gospel of Jesus Christ. In a lot of ways, John served as an intermediary transitioning from what they knew of the old law to what this new law was going to be about. Okay, And having Jesus come abruptly without the people even thinking to themselves, why do we need to leave the law of Moses? Why can't we stay with the law of Moses? That wouldn't have served the best purpose. And that's why John's, John was sent in the first place. And this is the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so then in verse 4, John came baptizing in the wilderness and preaching a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. And notice verse 5, Then all in the land of Judea and those from Jerusalem went out to him and were all baptized by him in the Jordan, doing what? Confessing their sins. Now I think it's interesting and important to note, okay, that this wasn't something that was done and, and there's only a couple dozen disciples of John. Okay, there's a bunch. Okay, we got multitudes and multitudes and multitudes. This message from John, from God, ultimately, resonated with people. Now, I think it's interesting that even though the leaders of the Jews didn't like John very much, okay, and we know that, they, the people, did. They considered him a prophet. And yet, it wasn't blasphemy for John to preach that the old law doesn't take away your sin. It wasn't blasphemy for John to say, the Messiah is coming, who is going to lead you from your sin. And the reason for it is what? What did the Old Testament, even in the Old Testament itself, teach was going to happen when Jesus came? He would lead the captives free. Okay? Even the old law itself taught, even though the Jews weren't aware of it sometimes, it taught that the old law could not take away sin. The fact that a Messiah had to come to change, to put an end to the law, to fulfill it, suggested that the law itself could not accomplish the goal of bringing mankind back to his creator. Something else had to be required. And so that's why John, this message is resonating with people, and they're going out and they're confessing their sins, which suggests the success of John reaching the hearts of these people to repent. If I confess my sin, what does it mean I'm doing? I'm recognizing it's wrong, and I need to turn away from it. All right, we'll stop there. We'll pick up here in Mark, continue talking a little bit more about this uh, baptism unto, the, unto uh, repentance for the remission of sins. Thank you, everybody.